<laughs> on bass, we have Mr. Jackie Newhouse. Jackie Newhouse on bass. On the drums, our great friend and mentor and oracle and all around groove master, put your hands together for the wonderful Ernie Darawa. Well, and we'll have other folks coming as we uh, as things progress. Enjoy.
you guys. You all have been fun, I hope. Well, Alan Haynes, Jackie, we just a lot of, a lot of blue stuff. We're gonna have the other guys coming. But anybody have any questions about how what are we doing with any of these instruments? Does anybody have a question? Be nobody. Brave. Be brave. Ask questions. I'm curious. What are we doing? <laughs> yeah. What are we doing? He's got one. Uh, how long have I played together? Before? How long have we played together? Absolutely. Probably not that long, but well, actually, yeah, maybe off and on. Uh, I met Alan 30 years, ago. 30 years ago. We used to play down on 6th Street, but we don't go down there much anymore. We don't go too crazy on that. But we enjoy playing together. We have fun. But then again, a lot, a lot of players play with a lot of different bands, so you know, we have different drummers, different. I play with different bands, these guys have different guys. So. But it's all like one big family, you know. Because then we have Joe and Don, which is really an honor to play with all these guys. I guess what? Yeah, anyway. anyway. Uh, <laughs> what do you want to say, Joe? It's been four years. So, you guys want to ask Ernie how he developed that fantastic shuffle? Because nobody can play a shuffle like Ernie Dudow. Well, okay. Uh, there's actually a little technique. You know, when we play drums, a lot of stuff that we do comes from single strokes and double strokes. So actually, the shuffle, what I was taught by my teacher, was a, it's, a, it's a rebound, basically. It's like, that's just one double stroke. That's just like the word says, rebound, rebound. And if I just keep doing it over and over, I've got. That's my shuffle. <laughs> you know. But the thing about it is that some of these guys, because you know, that's my right hand. Of course, my left hand is weak. If you're right-handed, you've got a little weaker left hand. So if I want to do it together, yeah, you hold the mic. And, uh, I used to do, uh, if I did this really fast, then, then it changes, and it's called a jump beat, because I'm jumping. So basically, I'm going like this. Okay. That's nothing but double stroke. Double stroke repeated over and over and over and over. And then I add the tempo to it, and that's like, it, you know, it also it becomes part of a swing groove, too, you know. So, and then if I want to put a backbeat on it, like a two and four, then it can go like this. And I'm adding the two and four to it, but you can play straight either way. And so many variations of the shuffle. Uh, somebody said you can play that flat, flat tower shuffle. <clears throat> I never heard that term, flat tower shuffle. Well, okay. Playing all the upbeats. So that's just another version of the shuffle. Just Texas double shuffle. Yeah. And uh, just shuffle it along. <laughs> anyway, does anybody, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? About, so, I mean, how many drummers are out there actually? All right. Yeah. How many? Huh? Three? Four? Five or so. Four, five. Yeah. So, uh, it's that simple, really. It's, it's not rocket science to play a shuffle. It's just learning to, to work your single strokes. Hold that. And your double strokes. That's right-handed, but you want to do it right-handed and left-handed. And uh, once you get the fundamentals down, then you add your musicality, and hopefully the guys here, especially the bass player, playing with a good solid bass player, you're going to lock in. in the rhythm section as well. Uh, really, the bass player, like, when, I, when I get a call for a gig, my first question is, who's the bass player? Uh, because if it's not the bass player that I want to play with, I don't take the gig. Yeah. It's important time. for me to have a good bass because that's how, you know, he, the bass player, he's like the, the glue to the whole groove, you know. 
there, there's no glue, then it's going to fall apart. Can, can, can you demonstrate that a little bit? Hey, guys. Like, can you guys demonstrate a little bit? Jack, Jack, Jack. Can you guys demonstrate a little bit of glue between bass and drums? Because this, this is actually really good for everybody to see. A little bit of isolation. Just check out some of the glue specifically. Yeah, I'm create the groove, so here's a groove and everybody just plays. stuff like Lock and Hopkins and uh, Albert Kahn, the guys that kind of really set the standard, and then you can add the more modern touches. There's so much information out there now that it's, it's it can get in the way. You want to know plenty of technique, but you want to know feel is the number one thing with, I think, all music, but with blues especially, the feel is the most important part, not perfection as much as if it feels good, it's usually good. <laughs> You were 16 when you decided to dedicate yourself to the blues in Houston. Um, 15. Okay. <laughs> Didn't drive. No, that was my fifth in a year. I, I saw Freddie King and Lightning Hopkins and all those guys. Oh, that's right. There's a microphone. 
There was a great place called Liberty Hall that I could go to when I was 15 or 16 and see Freddie King play all night. I wasn't supposed to be out, but... <laughs> when did you decide to, to be a professional musician? That was kind of the year I was playing since I was eight years old, but at 15 I saw these great artists that, and it seemed like an epiphany moment in my life where there, I saw Dwayne Allman play a few weeks before he passed and I saw Freddie King play all night and just recognized I want to do this <laughs> with your life. Yeah, well, I, could, I really didn't have any other choice at that point. I knew I was uh, going to have to do it. And once you're, it's, it's a motivation that's uh, very powerful because it's not about necessarily, you want to be successful and make money, but it's more about getting to play with my heroes. And I got to play with people I, I saw as a teenager. And some years later, I was recording with them and playing. So that's pretty good. <laughs> But it's, you know, you can't and, and buy a house. <laughs> Austin is a is known as a guitar player's town, as you all probably know, and um, the, he is up in the absolute uh, <laughs> pantheon of the great guitar players here in this town. Um, I'm going to throw a question to Jackie, as long as we have in here. We're talking about Stevie Ray. Um, Michael, you got that mind. So, um, has the bass evolved from? In, you, in the time that you've been playing, Jackie, since the 1970s, um, from a, a supportive instrument to more of a lead instrument? How has the instrument uh, evolved? Well, absolutely. You had, uh, you had people like, uh, well, so much solo instrumentalists like Jaco Pastorius comes to mind, uh, James Jamerson, of course, and, uh, just so many others. But, yeah, I would say. Keep <laughs> Anyway, but but yeah, it's definitely evolved. For it. there's just some incredible solo players out there now, and, uh, are just mind blowingly you know, brilliant technique. How many bass players in the house? Very out of place. Yeah. So, having just asked a question about the, the great solo bassists. Uh, know how to uh, to blend in with the whole band and yeah, how, to, how to stay play in the pocket, maintain the groove. Okay. All right, thank you. John. Uh-oh. I told you I saved the best for you. I'm on the hot seat. <laughs> What's up, my friend? Hi. So, um, this is the Texas Jazz and Blues uh, camp. Um, we know that every jazz group, almost every group, plays blues, but, but, but the, the ensemble that's here is a very different kind of blues. This is evolved from the Mississippi Delta, it evolved from Chicago blues and Texas blues. And there's a kind of a gulf between um, this blues and, and jazz players. And I want you to talk about, um, you know, how that's, how that's bridged. I know that, um, for instance, my notes here. I tried to do some homework on this, of course. Um, you know, the Muddy Waters Blues Band featured an album with Dizzy Gillespie mm -hmm. once. Coleman Hawkins started with Mamie Smith. Louis Armstrong recorded with Lonnie Johnson, the great blues guitarist. But, um, I mean, how, how, how does a seasoned, uh, extremely uh, high-level jazz musician like yourself approach the blues that these gentlemen are playing? Right, so first off, at the core of the blues is what these gentlemen have already said, which is a feeling the groove. So, and jazz is the same. The only real difference, actually, is the specific vocabulary. And what I mean by that, because we, we, we gotta find a pocket, we gotta find a groove, we gotta have the feeling. It's gotta be there, otherwise, honestly, it's a waste. It ain't happening. It ain't that. happening. It's just not, I mean, no matter how many good shots. No matter how many good, no, I, but you can play like the vocabulary wise, like linear vocabulary, right? So with the jazz blues language, the linear vocabulary is more evolved in the sense that we extend the chord progressions and add more chords and do more things with the chords. That's just the jazz language, it is what it is. But the thing is, at the very core, all of us who play straight ahead jazz, at, at a professional level, all of us know how to play the, the, the go right down to the, to the basic. You heard what, how, how Ponder played. Ponder can play all, all, Ponder knows all the harmony, knows all this stuff. 
that his solos were good examples of keeping it simple, seeking, seeking the pocket and, and digging in the pocket and playing, uh, focusing more on the melody themes. Right. Which is what these guys are more focused on. The harmony takes care of itself with the 12 bar blues that we all were playing every time. The harmony is very straight ahead. The themes are the key. And if the themes feel good in the pocket, that's, that's how you connect. You connect based on themes. Can, can, so can you just play us an example I totally, I totally of a straight, a straight, like, uh, you know, one, four, five blues, and then with the chord extensions and with sort of the more th the sophistication totally. that, that you hear? Right. So I'll start with a straight blues. <laughs> what we call a 5-4-1 blues, focused on that side of it, and focused more on the themes, da 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 more, and then, with the jazz, uh, more uh, change-oriented side of it, I play more linear, and so that's part of the jazz language, but you notice that I switched into, you probably know if I get to the four chord, I went and got a little bit funky for a second and switched back, and that's really what we actually tried to do, like the masters all did that, Charlie Parker, Hank Mobley, Freddie Hubbard, Lee Morgan, and Kirby Hancock, all the cats. You're going to hear straight ahead blues as influenced by gentlemen like this, and ladies, not ladies, but, but the, the ladies and gentlemen of the blues, you're going to hear that with all the jazz masters, for the most, especially the classic cats. Because we all, well, I'm, I'm not that, I'm not of that generation, but those of us who apprenticed with those guys, I was in Freddie Hubbard's band, I was with those cats, you know, I was with, gosh, you know, Tom Harold, you know, Herbie Hancock, I played with a bunch of people who, come from that spot, and then Roy Haynes, even a drummer, but still, he, he impressed that on me. The sense of the blues is always there. Mm -hmm. And that's the key. The key is, so the golf is actually not a golf. It's more like um, an extension of the style. I, I'll tell you one big thing about myself. Is I, one of the reasons I love coming here is because Playing with me and Ernie have done lots of gigs together, and I've done lots of gigs with Jimmy Vaughn, who's Steve Ray Vaughn's brother. And learning to play with those guys, that's helped my jazz playing a lot. Because the whole key to playing jazz well is understanding that while it can sound like a golf sometimes, it, yeah. depending on what the tune choices are and stuff, the actual heart and soul and foundation are the same. Okay, now now comes the heavy question. Okay, tell me. Okay, so it's about the future of jazz. So I mean, I could say, I could ask you, well, you know, who, who's trans, whose solo did you transcribe? And whose licks did you know? Did you learn when you were coming up? But I want to ask about the world of music that they are entering right now. Yeah. And there was a great cover story. Uh, Stefan Harris is a wonderful vibraphonist. I was, uh, I went up to Newark and did a story on him. Um, for, for National Public Radio and got to know him. Anyway, uh, he's on the cover of Downbeat Magazine and it's Stephen Harris dives into the future. Um, and it's the use of artificial intelligence in a live music setting. And let me just read one quote and then ask, ask Don what he thinks about this, where we're headed. So it's this app that Harris developed called Harmony Cloud. It employs technology like one that powers chat GBT. It was deployed on stage by the musicians, each of whom armed with an iPad loaded with seemingly every chord known to Western harmony could, with a touch of his screen, trigger a new harmonic pathway. Um, it would appear as a chord symbol on all the players' iPads so they could be informed and make musical choices accordingly. The triggered, this triggered musicians could, uh, the musicians could also dictate tempo and the rate of arpeggiation. So, I wish I could have heard that because I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind. So, so uh, Stefan Harris gave a clinic. Uh, he was the uh, guest artist at the Temple Jazz Festival, not this March, but yeah. last March. And we, I took my band and a bunch of 
a bunch of kids were there from the area. How many of you were at the Temple Jazz Festival last year? So, okay, you know, a handful of us, right? So y'all heard Stefan Harris? Yeah, so we heard him play, and he gave yeah. a noontime clinic, which was just, like, extraordinarily, yeah. like, it had all the right parts. It had a ton of ear training and not a ton of theory. It had the right balance of those two things. But it also had a lot of, like, interaction back and forth. So, you know, that's the first thing I'll just say, like, uh, he, he got a five-star re review for me just for the way he interacted with all of us in the audience. Yeah. But he brought that app out on stage, and he was using it, you know, during his clinic and then also with the big band later that evening. And it, it was actually, like, I, you know, don't quote me on this, but I thought it was kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> it actually, it, actually it, it, it didn't feel forced and, like, uh, you know, like, uh, funky, like a lot of technology can be. It felt like, it, 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 it seemed like it had some flow to it, you know, like, it, it felt... You know, there's a thing out there called the Center for Humane Technology, and you know, this felt like kind of humane technology. But so, what, that's what, my what, little bit about Stefan Harris because I saw him last year. Great. That's a, an amazing that's connection. Yep. Where is AI taking jazz? Is it taking it anywhere? Is there an an, an overlap? Well, let's let's. I mean, look, people didn't want to get on automatic elevators. In the 50s. You know what I'm saying? Like when the New York people spent 10 years trying to get used to getting on the elevator without a person, put, put, roll, roll, you know, rotating that switch to go up and down. So I think from a perspective of adapting to technology in general terms, I think um, if in the hands of artists with the vision that understands the core values of the music, that's really the key. It goes back to what my colleagues were saying, which is why blues is so important. It's why Richard and I actually, you know, one of the reasons we land on the name of this camp in the Texas Jazz and Blues Camp is because the key to playing jazz is, is tapping into the feeling, groove, emotions of the blues. And as long as you keep that going, bring on technology. I mean, this is talking about technology. Look at this thing. This is, this is, I mean, saxophone, a guitar, amplifiers, this is huge amounts of technology. Why not have AI slash software slash visual, you know, any kind of technology you can bring into it. I'm speaking in general terms now. So, it, 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 the way it goes, the thing is at the core, the key is to stay connected to the core values of the tradition, the core values of the style, the music, the styles, and the masters, right? So, and by core values of style, I mean what we said, groove, and I also mean things like the African American tradition, the fact that the music came from people who were expressing freedom after being released from slavery. That's what the music is really at its core about, blues and jazz, and a lot of gospel music. So as, as long as you stay connected to that and bring that emotion to the scenario, and the music doesn't become about the technology, we're cool. Now someone like Stefan Harris, that's a serious artist. I know him well, I've also played with him a number of times. I've seen him recently, so I don't, I'm not hip to this app. But because of his seriousness as a musician, it makes sense to me that he would come up with something it's amazing. that that ponder with with the cool, right? That makes complete sense to me from someone like Stefan Harris. That answer your question? Very much so. Okay. Yeah. So we shouldn't be afraid of this. We should accept it and see where. Well, let's put it this way. Um, like everything else, like everything else, um, we we all need to be vigilant about charlatans and people who are BSing us. Because quite frankly, in every style is that. And we all professionals, we can hear you. These guys can tell someone's up there calling themselves a blues player and they and they're slacking, they're gonna hear it in a second. Me and Ponder and Joe Morales and all of the pros here. If someone's calling themselves and people are bragging about it, it's like that's not we all can tell. We we can hear it all. So you gotta trust your professionals, you gotta seek if you wanna get serious about this music. Seek to train yourselves and get better and stronger at your own sense of discernment because you are making choices for yourselves. Discernment is key. What you listen to, what you choose, you got to be a gatekeeper for what comes in there because stuff that comes in hard and fast and it's being sold to you and, and, and thrown at you, you might, you might mistake it for something that's, that's actually a substance, but it might be just delivered efficiently. And that's a very important, being able to discern from that is super important, which is why we have teachers, which is why all of us are offering ourselves to you as guides through. Um, through the journey of life. This is true in general, right? So, yeah, so I would say, afraid, no. 
Eyes open. I won't even say cautious, but I will say eyes open. I'll say that. Keep your eyes open for everything. If you look at it, do some extra research. We got we got supercomputers in our pocket, every one of us. So, you know, dig in, learn things, be active participants in your journey of what you're trying to do for yourself. Don't just take stuff and let it come at you. People can wait to say everything. So put that in this place, understand what it is, look at it from a distance, say, okay, cool. But let me look carefully at this. So no fear, but care and conscientious, active engagement. Right. Sound good to me? Sound good to y'all on me? Yeah? yeah? Okay, cool. you, Don. Thanks, John. Um, I want to uh, change the subject here. We've got, uh, I think it's about 10 past 2, so I'm going to talk about the next 15 minutes or so. Yeah. Okay, so I am going to talk to you about this, one of the smallest, this may be the smallest serious instrument there is. This is a 10-hole diatonic harmonica. Uh, everyone's goofed off with it, uh, you know, our granddaddy's played it, et cetera, et cetera. It's a serious instrument, but I want to bring a different model of musicianship to you. Everybody that you're, have, that you're going to learn from and listen to this week are professional musicians or professional music educators or both. And um, that's not who I am. Um, I was a professional journalist for 43 years, and I just retired as a roving national correspondent for NPR. Yes, I had a recorder, and I had a microphone, and I had a harp with me at all times. And so, what I want you all to, to take away from this is that you don't have to be a professional musician. God bless you if you want to, and if you want to get your PhD in one and, and, and major in it, go for it. But you don't have to be a professional musician to love and enjoy and play this music your entire life. And let me tell you what, this is how I survived as a journalist who covered mass shootings and hurricanes and wars and everything else. I always had it with me, sometimes playing for um, Mujahideen uh, in Afghanistan, sometimes for Guatemalan counterinsurgency troops, uh, and you know, sometimes for my cab driver, sometimes for a sultan. This went with me. Um, and I learned it when I was y'all's age. I was 14 years old, and some, in some years. Uh, in Dallas, and I just picked it up, and I, but I did what musicians do. I put on uh, Little Walter and Paul Butterfield, great players, and I memorized what they played. And I just sat in my room as a teenager and just memorized those licks, um, and then started playing with everybody I could, and, and seriously considered being a professional musician because I played with a lot of people in Austin when I was in college, but then decided to go the journalism route and have never looked back. It's been a thrilling career, got to file from 30 countries. Um, but I want to talk about this amazing instrument. This is um, an accidental blues instrument. It, um, um, it was called a Richter tuning. When this was, in, when this was popularized um, in uh, the 20s and the 30s, it was made to play European music and, uh, and folk music. This, this instrument so that when you blow out, now we're going to talk music here because this is why y'all are here. I don't usually t tell this to my students, but so when you blow out, you get a, a, um, a C major seventh. You draw, you get the G major. So this is why harmonica players carry around 12 of these instruments. It's to, this happens to be tuned to C. Without dumping this out, I dragged 12 of these things around to sessions. Um, the genius of, the musical genius of black Americans is that in the 20s and the 30s, um, many descended from the enslaved, picked up this instrument and discovered that it had these amazing vocal qualities in it. Let me walk you through this. Um, 
because Matthias Honer, um, the great maker of the Honer harmonicas, Honer uh, melodicas, Honer accordions, um, so he put uh, a C and a D. And then there was the D flat. Number two blowhole, an E and a G. And then there was the F and the G flat. And then on the three hole, it was um, blow G, draw B. Who can tell me what the, the three notes were that were discovered between the G and the B? Very good. Excellent. The same thing on the four. You had a C and a D, an octave higher. And then on the higher, the high, high notes, you can also do it uh, blowing. I was trying to think, Don, is there any other musical instrument that makes music when you draw on it, when you, when you inhale? Because we blow everything, right? We blow all the horns. I mean, not exactly with bagpipes, but you're not drawing, you're like squeezing. Versus, right. You know. Yeah, but drawing? Drawing, I can't think of one. I can't think of one either. Yeah. Other, other, than, other than something like an e -lead, which maybe you could, you could be programmed to, if you draw, like an electronic wind instrument, might be able to do Yeah. So, an accordion, it's most, it's, it's, this is the little cousin of the accordion, which, which of course Hone meant. So, in the, my lungs are the bellows, and so you have um, brass reeds that are blow reeds and brass reeds that are draw reeds. Okay, so here's what happened when African Americans got hold of this instrument. Um, they found out that it has, that if you cross arc, if you start on uh, the, the second, the number two draw as your tonic, which will be a G on a C harmonica, that then you have the entire blue scale. And you can bend all those notes. So you've got all the blue notes, right? You've got a flat three, you've got a flat five, you've got a flat seven, and you're ready to go, man, when you've got those. Um, so let's talk about a little bit of, why don't you all play me, uh, play me just a, uh, just kind of a, fun, a funky riff uh, in G. Yeah. Kind of understated. Yeah. So it's all about bending the notes with a harmonica, right? Bending the notes, tongue control. It's about a tremolo with your hands. It's about breath control. to take these to old folks' homes and they have the entire population playing a harmonica because it's good for your lungs, right? Uh, it's about octaves. You play some nice kind of horn parts. That's the D and the 
F, the last two notes of the blues scale. So, thanks guys. Um, and of course, so every hole on the harmonica has like a different personality because it goes a different interval. You have those that just go down one half step, you have those that go down a whole step, those that go down a minor third, and every one of those has a, has a different character. Can you say that about, you can't say that about the saxophone, can you? No, that's that pretty, I mean, they sound different in different keys. Yeah. So that's, 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 and that's a, that's a kind of a special quality, but otherwise, there yeah. are the other things that make it different. Okay. So this is a very unique little instrument here, um, and it's infinitely pocket-sized, which is why I, I always have one with That you cannot say the that. There are no saxophones are pocket-sized. There are no pockets. Okay. I guess we could not, get, a, not, we not, get a pickle not, of. Not a right. So, uh, and so this is, this is tuned to the C. Um, hey, John. Yes. Okay. So there's a blues harmonic, harmonica, and then there's a regular harmonica. Well, uh, a blues harmonica is, is a ten-hole diatonic harmonica. That's what we call a blues harp now. Okay. And then there is another kind of harmonica, which is another beast altogether. And this is what I worked on last summer with all these great teachers. This is a chromatic harmonica. Can you play me a, a, a quick chromatic scale? Um, uh, C to C. different territory, okay? You don't need 12 harmonicas if you have this one. Um, it's much more challenging to play. There's not a lot of chromatic harmonica players out there. Um, I'm trying to become one. And, uh, but it's exciting because on this, we can play jazz. We can play Latin. There are great, um, and, and well, there are great blues players that play the chromatic also, but they tend to play in two keys, either E flat or D. Um, because the so that's kind of, and you have to play with chromatic bar players. Pardon me? You all have played with the, with the. Oh yeah. 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 Did you ever play with Kim Wilson? Kim Wilson? Yeah. But Kim Wilson is my harmonica guy. He was the harp player with the fabulous Thunderbirds. When I was a waiter at the Driscoll Hotel on 6th Street, I would get my tips, I would go to Antone's, I would go down there and I would stand outside the door in the alley and listen to Kim playing and play along with him. Wow. Question. Uh, how hard is it for you to learn the harmonica? How hard is it? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's like any other instrument. You have to, it's a serious instrument. I mean, there are people that are playing diatonics that are doing overblows, that are discovering chromatic scales on the, on the diatonic also. Um, you can fool around with it and play at it. I mean, to be quite honest, uh, you know, uh, Bob Dylan and, and John Lennon and a lot of people have played play it straight harp. And, you know, it's hard to play a wrong note on a tin holer when you're playing in that key. It's like a, it's tuned for you. And that's why it's so popular. But if you really want to get complete control of the instrument, the way I just showed you, where every hole in the harmonica you own, you can single out four different notes in one hole, and three in another, and two in another. Um, you know, it's, it's very doable. It's like, I, I, it's like teaching people to whistle. I, I try not to take students that can't already bend a note, because that's what gets you in the game. Once you can bend a note, once you can bend a note, you're like this when you open a note. Or you start bending.
always about these cycles. And then there's a whole, there's a whole world of Irish harmonica music also. sound like a crying voice yeah. and uh, it just you know it, it gives a lot of uh, a character to the the songs you're playing with what, what do you want to go out on a
everybody for listening. Put your hands together one time for John Burnett. Alan Haynes. Alan Haynes, the guitar. All right. Andrew Rawa. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. That was fantastic. That was really fantastic. Thank you. All right. All right. Keep on listen to the blues. Listen, listen, listen. How about one more, one more round of applause for everybody? Also, Pondy East and Festival and Pondy East. Joe Morales and Tina Sessions and Andrew Hutchinson. All right, y'all. Okay, I think it's combo time now.